Uh, we're going to be exploring a wonderful show, which is happening way downtown in Manhattan. Um, it is a real opportunity to um, see work that that has never actually been well I'll, I'll talk more about that but it's never actually been out of China um, and you know this the, the China Institute is all the way downtown it's right near Battery Park um, there's actually a garage on Greenwich Street which is about a block away from where the China Institute is um, the show is only on until Sunday, um, the 25th. It is a once in a lifetime opportunity to see this work. Um, so let's see, we will get on with it. The largest survey of its kind outside China. First in, in the US, Flowers on a River, The Art of Chinese Flower and Bird Painting, 1368 to 1911 masterworks okay basically more than 100 by 59 artists spanning 500 years um the concept of harmony of humanity in harmony with nature is examined as well as the use of a special language of coded imagery to communicate meaning which is central to Chinese art and culture. Bird, flower and bird painting is one of the three major genres of Chinese painting alongside landscape and figure painting, all of which I did not know. I mean, really that, that flower and bird painting is a distinct genre of, of paint, Chinese painting. I, I was really not familiar with until exploring this, this show. Um, the exhibit is presented in three parts. Um, Precious Plums of the Palace. Um, uh, fragrant Plums in the Wild. And um, Vitality of Nature, Flower and Bird Painting and social customs. So um, one of the interesting parts in, in this show is there are several, at least four, if not six, women artists who really excel at flower and bird painting. Um, and it was really the, the only accepted um, uh, genre for women to paint in, uh, at least publicly. Um, so there are there are several scrolls, and I will try and point those out when we get to them. Um, there are other women who were artists, courtesans, who were part of a kind of literati, and were were really great talents, um, and as it says here, a rare category of women artists made a living solely through their art. Um, so, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move along. And here is the entrance into the exhibit. Uh, so you get some idea of, of, of what you're gonna be walking into. Now, one of the amazing things is my wife and I went to the show on, I believe it was a Sunday, uh, might've been Saturday, but anyway, we, we went and there we were, the gallery was em literally empty. I mean, we were alone with these paintings for long periods of time. We spent a good two or three hours there and it was so wonderful to be alone with these pieces and be able to get up close to them and look at them you know, there are no guards in there, you know, telling us to step back. Uh, 
there's so much to see in, in the texture and structure of these paintings that, that it really does, you know, help to be able to get up close to them. Okay. Peach, peach blossoms, rock, and pair of birds. Um, and so what, I, what I've been, what I did was I had my camera with me. So all, all the shots that we have in here, aside from a few exceptions, were things that I took with my phone. And the reproductions that I got out of my phone are better than the ones that are in the catalog. So you can really see the quality of the, how the paint is put on and the washes and, and reticulations and depth of, of um, texture that happens with these. Um, so, uh, this artist was especially known for accurate descriptions of flowers and birds, combines, uh, the fine and freehand brushwork. His style is breezy and smooth and lively. He, um, you know, we're going to, we're going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about the different stuff. There are really, they have it articulated and broken down into, six different styles of painting. Um, they do cross over one another, but, but um, okay, here we go. Um, fine, fine brushwork in ink line drawing. Okay, so basically this is, it's very, very, um, fine brushwork, linear elements and all of that. That's one of the styles. Um, fine brushwork with light color washes. So basically what happens is there's an outlining that happens with this, with this technique. And then they fill the, the, um, the composition with washes. Um, and then there's the, um, lesser freehand, okay? Um, so basically what's happening with this is, is they, don't, they don't do the, the structure with a, with a line before they paint it in. They, they're painting the whole thing at once. So it's really um, one stroke and, and then they go back in with washes and things like that. But basically it's, it's really about, um, a kind of freer approach. You can see the difference in, in, in these, this little still life uh, in the center and, and the brushwork in, in the, uh, the um, lotus flowers that are, that are on the right. Um, okay, and then there's greater freehand. Which is which is really much more expressive, bold, large shapes, um, um, and then fine brushwork, boneless. What that what that refers to is basically they don't they don't do the the um, outlining before they paint the painting. They they actually do the brushwork um, without without the the pre um, lined out areas, and then the final one is freehand boneless, and and we'll see examples of this as we go further in into into the uh, show. Okay, and here's a view of of the gallery with my wife taking a shot um and this set of scrolls actually um you can see the cat that i have over in the left in the 
right hand uh, uh, scroll over there. This this is one of the female artists that that is uh, was part of the um, the court. She actually was a ghost painter for the Dowager Empress. She used to paint the paintings, and the Dowager Empress used to sign them as her own. Um, there's along with the more serious political and social symbolic meanings of many of the paintings, um, these paintings endow the animals and birds with, with human characteristics. Not knowing the references here, we're, we're left with this, with this really interesting character, this little cat. Um, and if you look at you look in into the scrolls, you can see. Well, actually, let me see if I can pull up the zoom so you can see it a little bit closer. Zoom in. Okay. Um, you can see, you know, basically the characteristics of these of these birds and and the cat. Um, really, really interesting. And in in all likelihood, these were references to characters in the court but we don't those are lost to us all we have is this really wonderful set of scrolls to look at ah i'm sure there's scholars out there who know a little more about this than i do but um okay so on the left uh, actually actually um um The piece on the left is, is an early piece. Um, and you can see it's very, uh, a very articulated image, the fidelity to, to trying to copy what the swallows were about was, was very important to this artist. And, and um, to some of the, the patrons, it was very important that that those details be articulated and 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 the kind of realism of of the of that particular bird is very clear. Um, where this piece on the on the left is much more um, loosely painted. It's much more expressive, um, very bold, uh, abstract kind of exuberance. And, and this painting was painted in the early 20th century. So the range from, 14, from 1496 to 1924, um, you can see that, there's, that there are very, um, different aesthetics that come into play. So the subtlety of these washes is incredible. I'm going to zoom in on this. Um, it, it, it loses a little bit of the crispness when I zoom in, but you can see the, um, the subtleties of the washes and how the, they're, they're really allowing the watercolor to be watercolor and the blending to take place. And they're not trying to control everything. Although there is a great deal that a, a very mature artist knows as far as how these things are going to kind of pool and, and blend and soak in, um, it's still allowing the material to be the material, allowing the, the, the presence of the, the paint to be part of the subject matter of the painting. And this piece, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zoom in, you know, this botanical is quite 
remarkable, you know, beautifully painted. Again, um, it is an early piece. Uh, let's see if I've got the date on here. I don't have it. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, when I was running through, running through taking these shots, I didn't always take shots of the, of the description next to the painting, but, um, you know, the subtlety of the, the darks and lights, you know, basically using, using those really beautiful, um, bleached out leaves in the background and these stronger greens in the foreground to accentuate the, the, the contrast between the green and the red of the flowers. Really beautifully done. Okay. And these are, these are six fans by six different artists. I'm not going to write out everything, but, you know, this is, this is one of the displays that's in the show. I'm going to close in on one that I found particularly fetching. Um, and, and again, you, you see the, um, the detail in the flow of the paint, these beautiful shapes of the, the blossoms and branches um, and the rhythmic um, veining in, in, in the leaves as part of the, the design of, of the all over pattern of the painting. Um, you know, the elegant negative spaces, the spaces between the leaves and the blossoms and the branches are really beautiful shapes and as important as the flowers themselves. Um, it, it's as full as the subject matter of the painting. Um, okay. And I'm going to, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do a zoom in again. I'm, I, I just love the details of these things. And when you get to see them a little bit larger, it's really helpful. And the wonderful part about this exhibit is you can stick your nose right up like, against the plexiglass and look at these things. Beautiful. Um, and then this piece over here, I wanted to close in on because up in here, you see this very fine web and you follow this web down and what do you find? <laughs> uh, I didn't even see it at first. When, when, I looked at the, when I first looked at the painting, I didn't even see the spider there, but there it is. Uh, okay. And now um, again, uh, these, these are painted on silk. So you can see, you know, when I, you know, this is a close up shot that I took of, of, of one of the pieces and you can see the, the weave of the, the actual weave of the silk. And I don't want to bore you guys, but. <laughs> but I really love getting in close to these things. And in fact, in many ways, I, I, I was able to see more out of my camera because it's, it's, they keep the, the gallery really dark for um, you know, conservation purposes. So in many ways, you can even see more out of, out of these shots that I took with my camera, with my, with my phone, than you can in some ways, in the actual show. And I, I just loved the use of 
leaving that white space between those between those shapes of the rocks. Larry, these paintings are so peaceful. Aren't they? They just put you in another zone. It's yes. Wonderful yes. to be here. Thank I, you. I'll tell you something. I, um, they don't have any chairs in the exhibit. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call them because we're going to try and go back this Sunday. And I'm going to see if, they're gonna, if they'll allow us to bring in a couple of chairs. Because I could just sit in front of one of these paintings for hours. Okay, now we're going to move on to a major piece that is in this show. And this is one of the highlights of the exhibition. Uh, Boda Shanran, uh, actually, Zuda, 1626 to 1705, commonly known as Boda Shanran, was considered one of the greatest masters of Chinese painting. Um, and this is one of his masterpieces. He was a prince in the imperial Ming family. Um, there was a, a change, a conquest that took place between the imperial periods. Uh, the Ming family was, was really ousted from power. And Bodhishanran went into hiding in a Buddhist temple. He became a Buddhist monk and actually at one point was the abbot of, of the temple. Um, after the Manchu conquest of 1644, um, he, from, from many, um, uh, uh, representations. He was known as the Mad Monk, uh, and I'll talk more about this. He he painted this scroll when he was seventy-two years old. Uh, it depicts the lifespan of a lotus flower. Um, this thing is enormous. I mean, it, it really is. It's. Um, Okay, here we go. Bada Shanran pushes the expressive possibilities of monochrome ink and brush to the extreme, resulting in incredible rich effects with an unmistakable individual, individual character, said Willow Whalen. I, I, can't, I can't even begin to, to articulate uh, Chinese names, forgive me, um, but she was a, she's the curator of the show. No one in the past has ever reached his level of achievement in this regard, and probably few after him will. So Flowers on the River is the name of the show. It is, it is named after this particular scroll. It probably would be a good idea if, I don't know if, if any of you are really familiar with how these paintings are viewed, but what the literati, what the scholars, what the artists used to do is they would share these pieces with friends, with certain particular groups of people, and they would unfurl a little at a time, a scroll. So you would not see the entire 509 inches of this scroll all at once. Um, probably in this show, there's more rolled out than, than would normally be shown by Bada Shanran. So I took shots of sections of this piece and we're gonna explore some of the details in that. Now again, this is, this is the freehand technique. It's very abstract, it's very loose. Uh, this, is, this was painted 300 years ago or more. And, and they are very abstract paintings. The expressive quality of the mark making, the, the range of, of, of tone within the ink is just remarkable. 
his use of the brush mark. You can see how you know he lets the 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 brush flay out, and he had such control over this, the ability to make these things. Um, on the one hand, be very clear and articulate, and at the other hand, be scratchy and, and stretched and, and uh, dry brush qualities. So I'm gonna move on. And you can see the subtlety of the, of the mark making, how, you know, basically he must have been using a, a very big, brush to be able to get some of the, the, what we would call in Western art, the scumbling, the, the marks, those scratchy marks that are within the, the patterns in here. Okay. And Joan Mitchell, 1969, Franz Klein, 1955. Um, so one of the things I wanted to, to make clear is the timelessness of, of these pieces. You know, basically Joan Mitchell was responding to poetry, to music in, in, in her work. And, and the same thing is true of, of Bodhishanran. He would write poems, uh, Across across his paintings, um, Joan Mitchell re referred to memories, referred to landscapes that she saw, saw in her childhood that that had come and gone. She refers to other artists. All that is true of Bodhishanran. That's all in his work. He is he is doing that now. When we come to Franz Quine, this bold telegraphic quality in these in these pieces you know it's enormous for for the so scale of the marking but if you look at the characters in Bodhishanran you see the articulation there's a, my take on this is that there is a presence in the mark making that that both Bhattachanran and the abstract painters who who use mark making as a as a way to communicate are articulating certain things in in those marks and literally in Bhattachanran these are words but they are also expressive marks an imperial family member of the Ming dynasty, his unconventional composition and remarkable freehand work imbued with abstract and conceptual elements, complemented by his unique poetry and calligraphy. The painting interweaves the imagery of the lotus and the orchid within the landscape setting, depicting the journey of the artist's life. Through his poetic verse and calligraphic expressions, the hand scroll delves into profound spiritual realms. Comparisons have been made be between Bodhishanran and the expressive work and Van Gogh. Um, this is a portrait of Bodhishanran. Um, I'm, I'm not sure who, who it was painted by. I, didn't didn't grab that, but I wanted to show show a portrait of him. Now, again, I I had mentioned this business of mad, quote unquote madness in Bodhishanran. One of the ways that he was able to survive was through feigning madness. Um, he he was able to. Um, be it's really self-preservation you know basically he was left alone um, 
there's a there's a a Taoist uh, quote which I really love. Um, no one asks for advice from a man who fishes with straight hooks. <laughs> so I think that I think that this you know. Yes, he may truly have been suffering from manic depressive episodes, and that may be part of who he was as a human being. He lived a long and full life. Um, he did retire from, from uh, the Buddhist monastery at one point and hung a sign on the door to his, to his house that said, dumb. In other words, he never spoke. He, he would laugh and weep. Uh, people said that they could hear him inside laughing hysterically. And I will get to why he was doing that in a, in a few minutes. But, you know, there's a lot of apocryphal stories. This is from, you know, <laughs> he died in 17... What was it, 1711 or something like that? Um, so it, it, it's, it's hard to say what's true and what's, what's a story that, that's a legend about him at this point. Okay. So back into the, the Lotus Scroll. And you can see these, these attenuated strokes that he would use. The, the rain, again, the range of marking, the range of, of darks and lights, the washes and, and the striations in different directions, um, you know, articulating a, a rock with just a few lines. Okay, and here's one of the reasons why he was laughing a lot. These these characters are uh, he has a lot of them, and again, these may be references to uh, um, people in court or whatever. But but there is you know in his birds, his cats, his his rabbits. There's there's definitely a expression, a um, a kind of personality that's 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 articulated, but they're so funny. I mean, those shapes are just so whacked out and wonderful. I can imagine him painting them and laughing hysterically. Um, the 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 piece in the upper left is not about a Shanran. It's but but I thought it fit with the with the the quality and this is in the show. Um, it's definitely these three the the uh, two cats and the rabbit are are Bodhisattva pieces, but they are not in the show, um, unfortunately. But okay, and just back into the scroll. And you can see how how very abstract these are as you as he's rolling out this this scroll. You can imagine the journey that people went on when they were experiencing it. And there's there there were there were poems that were attached to it in in various spots. Okay. So This painting was created by this artist when he was 70, featured a fingered citron plant, fully demonstrates the artist's outstanding painting skills, the use of both um, cent centered tip and side tip brushwork with its sometimes dry and sometimes moist, fills the image with an unpredictable variety, making it at once cool and warm, rustic and artful. Above uh, the painting is an inscription, um, 10 fingers full of fragrance and flavor, one fist 
broke all rules and standards. We're going to have to zoom in on this one. So you can see, you know, how the ink reticulates out the, the, the control, the sense of, of, of play between spontaneous and, and thoughtful placement of these, of these marks is really an incredible um, uh, tribute to, to this artist's ability. over here to the full. Again, I'm going to refer to the positive and negative spaces, the spaces around the painting. Those white spaces are speak as articulately as the marks. Oh, okay. So this is a, another one of the uh, wonderful women artists included in the show. The birds are lifelike and highly detailed in stark contrast to the delicate and subtle blossoms and the broadly brushed branches. Um, the inscription uh, indicates to longevity. Um, this has a literary or origin, um, commonly uh, wishing the elderly a long life. So this is, this is painted on um, a, a metal leaf. Uh, so you can you can really get the sense of of how much it was shiny when I was when I was taking the shot. When you look at the reproduction in the book, it doesn't give you that sense of this shimmer that's happening with this piece. Look at the branch itself, the articulation that's going on in there. How how that the nuance and and incredible brushwork, the stops and starts that make the eye linger. Okay. Again, large scale, um, It's a freehand uh, uh, brushwork on this panel. Um, each section has a poem um, to complement the image. So th there's actually, um, I believe, at least seven sections to this, to this scroll. I pieced together three of them. Uh, again, this is another one of the female artists. She was a, a very famous uh, courtesan. Um, at the time, she was very skilled at poetry and music. Um, she was really um, exalted. She excelled 
at bamboo and orchid painting um, and highly esteemed by uh, members of the court and the courtly literati. She really was, um, you know, one of those people that was kind of at the, at the center of, of the artistic culture at the time. And what I wanted to do was talk a little bit about the intimacy of these pieces and the Van Gogh. And basically there was a show um, in 2012 that was at the Clark and in Philly, it was called Van Gogh Up Close and close observation, very graphic brushwork. He was very familiar with the Japanese prints, but it's also the crossover to China, the Chinese influences there. So a lot of these really wonderful close-ups that take place in these, in these fans is something that Van Gogh would, would have been very familiar with. And so here's another. And another. <laughs> it was very hard for me to edit out things. <laughs> this wonderful piece. Uh, it's just, you know, the crab apple flowers. Um, so you can see over here on the, on the right, the full screen, and I just closed in on, on these birds and I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually zoom in on this guy over here. So you can see the, just the wonderful subtlety of mark making, the range of, of grays that, that, that this artist could get out, uh, out of this. And, you know, the interaction between these two birds is really incredible too. Larry, there was a question and I think yes. I missed it. it was, okay. It's, did he drag something to create the stems? So I'm thinking that might've been the, the long piece that you were talking about. Before. Okay. That, it's all done with the brush. It's all done with the brush. He's, he used, um, um, he, he used various sizes of brushes and things like that, but the ability to, to know how to extend that, attenuate that line like that is really one of the masteries of, of, of the work. But yeah, uh, that, that's a, that's, it's a good question. As far as I know, it was all brushwork. I just love this one. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. So this um, uh, wonderful flower with these flakes of gold leaf in it, I just wanted to do a, a close up for you all to see. There are several of them uh, that, that, that are like this. The peony uh, paintings are, are really, you know, wonderful. And there's a whole scroll. There are scrolls and scrolls of flowers in this show too. I, I, didn't, do, I didn't do a lot of them, but you get, you get the idea. And look at the look at the interaction between these two characters over here. You know, these cranes are are like, you know, what are they up to? And what's that conversation about? Ah. And again, I'm I'm gonna have to zoom in because the 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 beauty of this. These, the interaction of these washes, the subtlety, the nuance of, of, of line and wash. Um, these are freehand. And then, and then I believe the, the line is painted in after the, the, 
the wash has a chance to set up fairly well. Beautiful lotus. So these white marks that you see, they're, they're shine from the lights in, in the gallery. And you can sometimes see my shiny bald head showing in the, in the background, but um, you get the idea. These, these really are better than the reproductions that are in the, in the catalog in many ways. And here's a big view in the gallery. And then there's this, this business of the still life. Um, th this piece, chrysanthemums and crabs, it's, it, you know, you see in the bottom of the net, there are crabs in there and there's a couple that are trying to climb out. Um, wonderful. But look at, how, look at how it's painted. Look at how freely those, those elements are done, but you get the idea of this, of this mesh, of this, um, this container that has air in it. Um, and, then, and then this wonderful little still life with this vase where the top is turned towards us. This is backwards perspective. In fact, the bottom is flatter than the top and that's backwards. When you're looking at, at, uh, at ellipses, the ellipse on the bottom should be much rounder than the ellipse on the top. When you're looking down at it, you, you would see it as much more of a circle. So there's a kind of cubistic business going on in a lot of these pieces. These were not painted directly from nature. They are, they are contemplated, they are looked at, they are understood, and then they are, they are painted from essence. Um, and some are more that way than others. Some are more are about trying to remain with the fidelity to the realistic object. And others are more about going after just the spirit, the essence of the thing. Um, and here we have Badashanran flower in a jar in 1689. And here we have Giorgio Morandi in 1964. And you get the sense of empty spaces, of positive and negative space, of shape interaction, of this cubist and yet, and yet flat shape the, these there's there's a wonderful quality to that that flower in a jar you know the range of the dark on the on the left around into the very lightest gray in that back petal and look at that look at the the container that just incredible mark. Okay. One of the other things about Bodhishanran is is his birds, his creatures don't directly interact. You know, the one on the bottom is a sleeping goose and the one on the top is staring up, maybe apprehensively, we don't know, but there's their relationship, they're near each other, but they are not related to each other. They're not interacting with each other. This is something that's very common in Bodhishanran's paintings. Um, that business of looking up is 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 um, very common in in his in his birds. And this um, 
this lotus is is actually in the show. This Badashanan piece is in the show. You can you can see my bald head right in the middle of that. Uh, the the um, wonderful range of marking, the articulation, the the essential forms that he goes after is quite remarkable. Again, look at that, look at that brush mark. You know, it must have been a very, very, he must have had a really large brush to be able to have that unbroken mark go all the way through. Um, and I put this in contrast to Sunda, um, a wonderful painting, but very different, a very different feel, a very different aim for the piece, although beautifully painted and beautiful color. And I love the rocks. They're just wonderfully painted all the way through. This is a fabulous show. If you can get down tomorrow or Sunday to see the show, I can't recommend it highly enough. Um, the, um, there are a series of YouTube lectures by James Cahill that are just fabulous. There are a lot of lectures on Chinese painting, but there, Cahill did flower and bird painting. He did two, two lectures on flower and bird painting. And he also did two lectures on Badashanran where he uses the quotation uh, marks around madness uh, to, to put that in perspective and say, yes, maybe he was mad and maybe he was a genius. Uh, <laughs> so I um, thank you for sharing some time with me and I hope you enjoyed this talk. <laughs> thank you, Larry. Okay. It was a wonderful talk. It's very peaceful. Thank you.